Okay. Um, so without further ado, tonight's what's up is being presented by our own Dick Flat. And the subject is will the tangled web we weave led the web space telescope. So take it away, Dick. Can I hear you? Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yeah, hello. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, and uh, uh, good evening. Uh, happy to be here. I um, I'm going to do a short presentation on a couple of specific uh, aspects of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Um, what you see here is uh, in the first slide is a, mock a full scale mockup of the telescope in front of the Goddard Space Center. Uh, it's about the size of a uh, tennis court and it weighs about 13,000 pounds. It is slated to do some astounding science looking back to the very beginnings of the universe and other very interesting things. But in addition to that, uh, it's just an incredibly complex uh, spacecraft with, uh, with just incredible engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, thermal, electrical, um, optical engineering. And it, uh, it, it has about, well, it has several hundred parts to it, moving parts that will, uh, I'll explain it a bit uh, in the next slide, but it has hundreds of parts with uh, pulleys and gears and actuators and latches and motors uh, that all have to work for, uh, for the mission to be a success. Um, and the, uh, the telescope itself is, uh, is broken up into three basic pieces. The observatory, which is at the top of the uh, on top of the sheets that you see here, uh, that's the that's the gold mirror and uh, the uh, the sensors. That's the actual telescope. The sheets that you see below it are five layers of very thin uh, plastic coated sheets that act as a thermal insulator, uh, separating the hot side, which is the bottom, from the cold side, which is the top, uh, or the, uh, the actual telescope itself. Um, so the, the bot on the bottom is, is, the, is the structure called the bus that contains uh, the control electronics and thrusters and uh, communications gear uh, that let it communicate with Earth. Um, it has a six, six and a half meter gold primary mirror that you can see there. And interestingly, this has been in the design and construction phase for over 30 years, and it's cost $10 billion. Um, the question I had in my mind, I'm not going to go through the whole web telescope in this short talk, but uh, the question I had in my mind was, at why for a 30 year effort and $10 billion was the design lifetime only five and a half years. Um, the, um, let's see, I have, um, okay. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the interesting aspects of this is that the cold side after it's deployed, can essentially never see a heat source. It can never be faced toward the sun or the earth or the moon or thruster jets. Um, the hot side is always, uh, or the bottom, is always faced toward the earth and the sun. Uh, it, it, um, it has to reside at the Lagrange point, which I'm going to get into, and uh, those are stable or metastable points in space. Um, and this is being launched to the to the L2 Lagrange point, which is a, a million miles uh, in space directly opposite the sun. So it, it's a Lagrange point that follows or is locked to the Earth's orbit. And we'll get into that a bit more. Um, 
The mission itself is geared toward uh, answering questions about the origin and evolution of the universe, uh, what dark matter and dark energy is, and looking at the uh, atmospheres of exoplanets and especially looking for biosignatures, that is uh, organic material that, uh, uh, that may indicate the possible presence of life. Okay. And my presentation is frozen up. Um, I can't get to the next slide. Let me try restarting this <laughs> quickly. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. It's based on the fuel available. It's less than two billion. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's. Uh, I'm going to have to try restarting this one second. It was working right before the meeting. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, also, the uh, the space telescope itself. Oh, can everybody see this image or not? No. Is this the? Okay. Um, can any anybody see this animated version? No, I don't see the your face. Very wonderful face. All right, let me um, let me try again. Uh, yeah i had to uh, leave the zoom meeting and reconnect just now okay um let's see if we have it now this is the first slide and it's not letting me show the second slide. Let me um Hey Dick, why yep. don't you try? Uh, don't actually present the presentation, but share the window that the presentation is in. That's what I do. It doesn't take over your screen. It might be a little more successful. Um, okay, how do I do that? When you hit your share screen button, you get all these choices, right? Uh, not many. Well, uh, if your presentation is open as a document, as if you were editing it. You pick that and don't hit the present button where it takes over your whole screen. Okay, like this? Yeah, now we can see it. Okay, well, uh, it's smaller, but uh, let's go with it this way. We've gone through the, uh, 
uh, the first one, the first slide. Uh, let's see. No, it's not letting me. Uh, oh. Now, hmm. Okay, there's the second slide. The third slide is supposed to be an animation, but it doesn't uh, show as an animation in this view. Um, NASA says that uh, it's like origami. To me, it's not like origami. It's more like transformers in space. Uh, it has so many moving parts that are unfolding and refolding and tensioning and whatnot. Uh, it, uh, it, it's, uh, it's just an amazing uh, piece of engineering. Now, it sits at a Lagrange point, and the Lagrange points uh, in the Earth-Sun system are points where the, um, uh, where the centrifugal force of, a, of an object at the Lagrange point is balanced by the, uh, by the gravitational attraction to the Earth and the Sun. And we're operating at Lagrange point two for a variety of reasons, uh, some of which are that um, it's close to the Earth, uh, it's easier to communicate that way, uh, and it keeps the Earth and the Sun on both sides of the spacecraft so that both the Earth and the Sun can be uh, uh, can be exposed to the hot side of the craft without exposing the cold side mirror. Um, uh, again, there are five Lagrange points in the Earth-Sun uh, system. Uh, the L2 is on the far side, on the opposite side of the Earth from the Sun, and that's where the James Webb will be um, orbiting doesn't sit at the Lagrange point, but it, uh, it orbits the Lagrange point. And we'll get into that in a bit. There are other Lagrange points uh, that you can see, one closer to the sun, one on the other side of, of the sun, and then two that form equilateral triangles with the sun and the earth. Um, now, one, the Lagrange point, um, uh, the Lagrange points, if you're used to looking at um, topo maps, would look like this, where the the two the two deep wells are right at the at the sun and the earth, and the, but there are five points where the where the uh, 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 the potential field is zero. That is, there's no net force on an object sitting at those points. Um, another way of looking at it would be like this where I have Lagrange point two showing the on the opposite side of the sun, op opposite side of the earth from the sun. And that's, you can think of that as almost a, a, a mountain pass, a pass in the mountains. Uh, this next one is an animation that uh, is not animating because we can't get into the presentation mode. Um, but it shows that the Lagrange points are locked to the Earth and they rotate around the sun. They orbit the sun locked to the Earth so that L2 is always on a line between the sun and the Earth beyond the, uh, beyond the radius of the Earth. Um, now, the, there are five Lagrange points. It turns out that Lagrange points four and five are local minima. That is, they're stable. If you if an object is there and you push the object a little bit, it comes back to the bottom of the bowl where it's stable. And in some in some uh, uh, situations, like with uh, with Jupiter, you have uh, you have uh, you have asteroids that and other other junk that collects at those points. Uh, the L2, the L1, L2, and L3 are saddle points. They're metastable. And L2 is uh, stable in two dimensions, but not in the third radial dimension going out from Earth. So that if uh, we can only have the thrusters thrusting in one direction, that is uh, toward the Earth, pushing the satellite out. Uh, and if we, because we can't, we can't let the, uh, the scopes see the hot exhaust gases from the uh, uh, from the thrusters. So the thrusters, the scat thrusters on on the spacecraft, uh, fire about once every month to keep it in an orbit around that Lagrange point, 
without ever going over the mountain pass. If we ever go over the mountain pass, uh, then the satellite just kind of drifts off into space and there's no way of recovering it because we can only have uh, the thrusters on one side. It's kind of the orbit is, as you see in the uh, roughly the, uh, the yellow banana shaped thing. And uh, again, once a month, we give it a, we, they give it a push to keep it near the Lagrange point orbiting around the Lagrange point, but never going past the Lagrange point. It's kind of like syphilis rolling the um, boulder up the mountain. You never want to get over the peak because then the boulder is gone and you'll never get it back. Um, the actual orbit that has been chosen, uh, this is a, uh, these are four views. The, the bottom view, the bottom left view is a side view where the point on the left side is the earth and the point on the right side of the, is the Lagrange point. And it, uh, you can see that it's, the orbit is tilted uh, in relation to the Lagrange point. If you look at the, the bottom right, that's the view from the Earth, and you can see that the the orbit uh, is is not quite consistent. It's like a whole series of threads uh, that go in a roughly uh, elliptical shape um, around the Lagrange point, and the the top the top right is a view from the top. Again, you can see the uh, the orbit going around the Lagrange point. One could ask why not just stay at the Lagrange point. Uh, and the reason for that is the, uh, the spacecraft is solar powered. And if it stayed at the Lagrange point, the earth would be between the sun and the, and the solar cells and it wouldn't have power. Uh, so it has to orbit around the Lagrange point with an orbit that's big enough to avoid any shadowing from the earth or the moon. Uh, so that's that's the basic reason for orbiting around the Lagrange point. The um, the mission itself, uh, there are some constraints to it. The 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 telescope must remain cold, exposed to the to the black vacuum of space, and never see the sun or the Earth or the moon, or the thrusters. Uh, and because of that. And because it needs a it needs a bump every uh, every month or so to keep it in that metastable orbit, uh, it uses fuel, and uh, the fuel that it uses has to be had to be uh, supplied at the at the point of launch, and for all practical purposes, it can't be replenished. Uh, this thing is operating a million miles from Earth, which is four times the distance to the Moon. There's no way to get any manned repair or refueling uh, operation out there. Uh, there has been some thought about maybe refueling, you know, several years from now, but the tech technology is not here yet. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the technology for the Hubble was not, didn't exist when the Hubble was commissioned when they started working on it. So it, that's, a, that's a possibility. But the, the original mission life of five years was uh, a constraint imposed by the, uh, by the amount of fuel that could be uh, loaded on board at launch. Turns out that the Ariane rocket was so precise in its initial launch that, it, that the mid-course corrections were minor and they were able to save a lot of fuel from the scat thrusters uh, that they didn't have to use for mid-course corrections, and they can now use for an extended uh, mission period orbiting the Lagrange point. And right now, uh, they're confident that they have well over 10 years and probably about 20 years of fuel now uh, for to do an extended mission to do just wonderful science. Uh, so... Right now, uh, they're in the process of aligning the mirrors. This is one of the last latest uh, mirror alignment uh, 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 photos that they had, images that they had. Each of the 18 segments is now focusing a star and they're in the process of now doing a fine focus on each of the segments and then stacking those segments to make one star image. 
Uh, there are um, a couple of websites that you can go to to track the progress uh, as it goes through. I, I like the blogs.nasa.gov uh, website myself. Uh, and I thank you. Um, so the, the bottom line is that it's at L2 for communications purposes and to keep it cold. And because it's at L2 and it's metastable, uh, it needs a little bit of uh, thrust every once a month to keep it in that metastable orbit. And that's why the uh, initial um, uh, design, uh, the initial uh, mission design lifetime was five years, but by some very uh, talented engineering and good luck, we can probably look forward to maybe up to 20 years of, uh, of useful life for the telescope. So thank you very much. Bravo. Uh, okay, well, why don't you bring me a, don't you bring me a question up here? So everybody can hear. Oh yeah, explore. Dick? Yeah. Um, why, who, why do we have those Lagrange points? Who, who what are, what's their purpose? Why did we identify those? I'm sorry, why what? Did we identify those five Lagrange points? Was it for just the web thing? No, the, the, those, those. I don't know what those are. Oh, the Lagrange points are points where in space, where uh, where the centrifugal force of an object at a Lagrange point is exactly balanced by the gravitational forces of the of the moon and the earth and the sun so that in principle it's it's a stable point uh, that requires little or no energy to uh, to maintain that position uh, and mathematically, when you work it out, uh, in the Earth-Sun system, there are five Lagrange points. Um, and the, the one that is best for this mission is the L2 Lagrange point, which is uh, on, the, uh, on the other side of the Earth from the Sun, about a million miles out. So, so other missions could go to those other points? Uh, there are a few other missions at the L2 point. The Spitzer telescope is there, and I, I believe a few other uh, few other spacecraft well, are there. I've never heard of anybody yeah. referring to that name. Mm -hmm. oh, and, and Dick, one more thing. Like, you know how you take a mirror and, you, and the, you shine it in the sun and then shine it on someone's face? Yeah. What if you turned around that James Webb and it and it reflected that big old thing towards the sun and then we could uh, like maybe an alien flying by would see that big reflection. Well, there, <laughs> I'm just probably, saying, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> probably easier ways of communicating with aliens. The problem is that the James Webb telescope, uh, the the observatory side can never see any heat. It operates at very close to absolute zero, and if you turn it toward the sun. It's going to, the, the whole telescope mirror assembly is going to heat up and it'll take months and months to cool back down, even if you, even if you uh, reorient it afterwards. Um, there's, uh, there are no uh, telescopes at L, or there are no spacecraft at L3 because that's, the sun gets in the way uh, from the earth, uh, so we can't communicate. The web can't operate at L1 because it would the cold side would either be toward the Earth or toward the Sun and it couldn't cool down. And L4 and L5 are really distant and hard to communicate with. And uh, there is some junk uh, because those are truly stable points. There is some junk that's collected there. And I think there was some concern that uh, uh, there may be some they could incur some damage at those points. But uh, yeah, you don't want to turn the telescope around and point it toward the sun. That would that would not be a good thing. Yes, very unhappy camper. No. <laughs>
I think there's a couple of solar uh, space probes, the Stereo mission orbits L1. Yeah. Okay. Well, if, if, you know, if it, uh, yes, those spacecraft can orbit at L1 as long as it, it doesn't need to be super cold, cryogenically cold, because it, yeah, if you're at L1, you're either going to be facing uh, the Earth or the Sun, both of which would be heat sources. My question is, how did they manage to take a selfie and save a WST? I'm sorry, to take what? A selfie. It took a picture of itself. Oh. Uh, yes, they did take a picture of the uh, of the primary mirror. Uh, there was a um, uh, there was a special lens that uh, that they incorporated into the spacecraft on the uh, near the actual sensor that looked back at the at the primary mirror uh, just to see if everything was okay. Um, and it, that one image did. I uh, did show that the, one of the mirrors was reflecting a star light from a star back into the uh, back into the near infrared camera. Yeah, but they didn't have any any uh, cameras to do selfies during the deployment to make sure that the deployment was going right. There were you know a hundred steps, several hundred steps in the deployment. And those were all done with sensors and not confirmed with a camera or cameras. Uh, they considered that, but then didn't do it because of the added weight to the actual launch. They decided to use that that weight for something else, like fuel. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right. Anybody else have any questions? Oops. That's me. Anybody have any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, Dick. Appreciate it. Do you have any questions on the chat? Sorry, I have something about that. We have Stereo and B are not having range points here. Some solar missions with L1, that's correct. Anybody remember the L5 society, by the way? That was what we were going to stick up. Space, uh, yeah. Space station. Okay, well, this comment that says article saying it's going to look at solar system objects as well as to deep space. I'm trying to remember what solar system one is. It is. They're going to look at the from the outer planets. Yeah, the outer planets. Jupiter, yeah, I think, no, I think Jupiter's almost too big and <laughs> it's too bright. Because they know, how to, they know what those planets have and consist of. Sure. So it's like calibrating their instruments. Exactly. Right. Before yeah. they start looking at Earth. Okay. Is everybody ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, um, continue with the evening here. Uh, the next talk, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Jeff Atkins, who's been with us many times before. He's a long time member. Jeff is a former NASA astrophysics education ambassador and long time MBAS member who teaches astronomy and physics at Deer Valley High School in Antioch and Los Pedados College in Pittsburgh. Jeff has a master's degree in astronomy from the University of Arizona, earned via a fellowship in the 1990s. Jeff wrote a textbook on sexual astronomy, which is used at both schools. And one, of the thing, excuse me, one of the things completed on this astronomy bucket list, he has seen several solar eclipses, these giant telescopes on mountaintops, 
use the Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope, use the Mars Global Surveyor, and participated in many different astronomy education training programs. Still left to do is to see the Aurora Borealis in person and see Alpha Centauri in large and small Magellanic clouds with his own eyes. Welcome, Jeff. You got me, Jeff. Stop sharing this screen. Yes, I know. He needs to share. Well, okay, I'll, I'll do that. See, one day. Okay, you should see that screen now. Yeah. Everybody see it? Okay. Hi, everybody. Hello. I've forgotten to, to mention in my list of all my accomplishments that I am now. After many years, finally, a quali highly qualified astronomy teacher, the district came to me a few months ago and said, oh, well, you're not highly qualified to teach astronomy. You're going to have to switch subjects. And I said, wait a minute. I, I wrote the textbook for my class, and I have a master's degree in astronomy. What do you mean I'm not highly qualified? State of California says you have to be certified in geoscience and be able to teach geology if you're going to teach astronomy. And for many years, I told them I have a physics degree too, so you know I don't really need a geoscience degree. But they weren't buying it, so I had to take a seventy-five dollar test, and now I'm highly qualified. <laughs> 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 so that's good to know. I was I was really concerned that I wasn't qualified to teach the thing I've been teaching for thirty years. But anyway, um, my uh, presentation tonight is about circles and wheels that you use to figure things out in the sky. And I've got three of them set up for you. And uh, <clears throat> the materials are downloadable and they're on my website, astronomyteacher.com. And I link to that in the information that was sent out for the newsletter. And uh, you can make these things yourself. You can just watch this presentation, see how they work. You can buy some of these things if you wanna just spend money on it. But the idea is to make something for yourself to help you uh, look at the sky and figure out how things move around and still make a case that there is a place for these uh, analog sort of devices in the world of digital astronomy. Uh, there's a few reasons why you might wanna be interested in such things. So I'm going to uh, show you how to construct the paper and uh, pencil glue together make, uh, homemade versions. Then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how to use each one um, and uh, answer questions along the way. So um, I got the chat open. I can see the chat. You can also unmute yourself and ask a question at any time. I'm good to go. And then I'll uh, be doing a couple of small demonstrations. I'll switch away from the PowerPoint and show you a camera view once in a while. Um, I use Zoom on a regular basis at the community college. So I'm pretty used to flipping back and forth between cameras and presentations and stuff. But uh, if at any point you can't see something or you can't hear something, just let me know. So tonight our agenda is to do three things. Uh, one is a thing you, uh, you might be able to do this in your head, but it seems to help my introductory students is to calculate the phase of the moon and which direction it is and what time of day it is. So we cooked up this little diagram I'm gonna share with you about how to figure that out. The second one, you're probably familiar with planospheres. So I'm gonna show you, a, I got a small collection of planospheres and we're gonna make one too, based on a design from Dr. Alan Gould at the Lawrence Hall of Science, and it's been around for many years. We're gonna make one of those. And I made, uh, I've made a couple of them and I've got a kind of a great big one too I use for groups. It's kind of handy to have a giant planisphere for groups because uh, it's a lot easier to see than a small screen. And then we're gonna also do a, a, an astrolabe, which is an ancient medieval sort of a super planisphere for calculating the positions of the sun and the, uh, figuring out the, what time it is at night. And also it's got a star map built into it. So we're gonna make one that has uh, been around for a while on the web that you can print out. And, uh, and uh, you know, I've only used it a few times to be honest with you, it's not a common tool for me, but I, I refreshed my memory and made another one so I can share it with you and tell you a few things about it. So uh, we're just gonna do these in order of complexity. We'll start with the simplest one first. And uh, I'm acting on the assumption that some of you may be at home on your uh, connecting through Zoom or maybe in the meeting are going to attempt to make these with me as I go. So I'm going to kind of, you know, carefully walk through this and answer any questions you have. So we're going to begin with the um, moon phase calculator. That's this piece of paper that you may have downloaded or seen somewhere. Um, the moon phase calculator is the simplest of the three. It's very easy to use and 
once you get the hang of it, you've done it a little while, you kind of don't need the diagram anymore. You can sort of do it in your head. But um, like I said, for beginners and people who don't think about this stuff much, uh, it seems to be useful. A lot of my students, uh, you know, they've never systematically looked at the moon. They will know that it's there and it's sort of, it's sort of a surprise that, oh, the moon's up. Uh, and then the next day, oh, the moon's gone. And they don't really see any pattern or reason to it. So I assign them the task of watching the moon for two weeks every night so they can see the progression of the phases, at least at a convenient hour. And, um, and along the way, I want to teach them about how to, the phases connect to the time of day and the direction you see in the moon. So we came up with this diagram. And this diagram contains what I call the triangle of moon phase information. And that triangle is the, like a tripod. And all three legs help to stand up and tell you the answer. So the time that the moon is visible, the direction that you see the moon, the cardinal direction, north, south, east, and west. And what is the phase of the moon are all connected. And the argument is with any two of those, the third one is automatically determined and must be a certain thing. The moon phase calculator diagram will help you figure that out. So here's how you make it. You, the little, little diagram in the corner I call the tool, you uh, cut it out and you lay it on top of the picture and then you're done making it. Because <laughs> that's pretty much it. Uh, you just lay this little uh, piece of paper here uh, lay that on top of the picture. You're going to rotate the picture. Uh, you might be tempted to punch a hole in it and make a little grommet to spin it on, but I don't, I don't ever bother to do that. Uh, after I uh, normally I just draw this on the board, you know, but for the presentation I made a fancy one, and then I forgot to leave off the sun. I forgot to put the sun in. Sun's on the right hand side here, shining light from the right towards the left, and uh, that's also true for the Earth beneath. So um, I'm going to explain what the tool is about, and then we're going to practice using it. So even if you if you have a printed copy of this, you can just tear that tool off. Or if you have a digital copy, you could actually you know do a little screen grab of that picture and lay it on top of the diagram and rotate it in your favorite graphics program. But uh, the idea is that you do it on a piece of paper. So what does this uh, little tool represents is uh, the same thing my students have to do when they watch the moon. They're supposed to go outside in their backyard, look south, draw a line for the horizon that goes all the way from east to west. And when you are facing south, east is on your left and west is on your right. And then uh, they make this the uh, line here, therefore, represents the horizon. Anything under the line is not visible to you because the Earth's in a way. If it's above the line, you can see it. And the giant green arrow is also a clock hand that tells what time of day is it on the Earth. So in the present figure you see here on this slide, the giant green arrow is pointing directly at 6 p.m. So this is the configuration of the moon at 6 p.m. So what we do is we rotate the tool to match a, a situation. Uh, with two of the three pieces of information in the triangle. And the third one then becomes the question that I can ask students, like what time is it when the full moon rises in the east? And they can use this tool to answer questions like that. So uh, that's the interpretation of the tool. If it's rising, it's on the eastern side. If it's setting, it's on the western side. If it's in the south, it's high as it gets that night. And uh, if you point something to the southeast, you go in between south and east in this direction. Southwest is this way. And you don't see north on here because in the northern hemisphere, the, the moon is not in the northern part of the sky, except in some extreme summer seasons. It might be a little bit north of west and a little bit north of east. But generally, the moon is never due north where we live. So it's not represented here because you'd never see it. You'd have to redesign this for the southern hemisphere. OK, so let's uh, see how it works. Um, now, there's three different kinds of questions you can ask. One is if you know the time and the phase, one is know the phase and the direction, and one is if you know the time and the direction. So any two of the three, there are three different possible combinations, and uh, that's how you operate it. Now, um, I can uh, animate this a little bit, and uh, let's see if I can do that. Here we go. I can rotate it. So in practice, you're going to spin it around like this when you're using it. So uh, let me make my window a slightly different shape so I have more room to play here. There we go. I think you can still see that all right. So uh, if you know the time and the phase, the method is to point the arrow at the time, say this would be 6 p.m. like this, then locate the phase, first quarter, and then see what uh, direction is closest to that phase. So this first quarter moon at 6 p.m. would be most closest to the south, so you'd see it in the southern sky. So that's an example where you know two things and ask for the third. In the second example, if you know the phase and the direction, you locate the phase, say it was way at waxing gibbous. And of course, waxing gibbous is this whole quadrant, not just the center position. But uh, you know, 
Uh, that means that this is not as a super precise tool, but just gives you sort of a range for where the moon might be. But I usually just pick the middle one when I'm teaching it, but I do want them to know that only first quarter, third quarter, full and new are moments in time that happen at a precise instant. And everything between first quarter and full is all classified as waxing gibbous, for example. Anyway, so in this, if you know the phase and direction, you might say waxing gibbous, and what direction is it located? Maybe waxing gibbous is in the west, so you'd rotate that around and put W next to waxing gibbous, and then the arrow would point to the time. And then finally, if you know the time and direction, you point the uh, green arrow at the time, say it's 3 p.m., and then uh, I want to say, well, uh, I see a moon in the west, but what's its phase? At 3 p.m., if you see the moon in the west, it must be uh, waning crescent. So um, that's uh, pretty much how it works. We're just going to do a few practice problems to get the hang of it. Let's start off with this practice problem. So if you're doing this with me, I'm going to ask you this is multiple choice. And you can respond in the chat, or you can unmute and tell us what you think the answer is. So uh, here's an example. It's 6 p.m. And the phase of the moon is first quarter. What direction is it? So uh, if you, the tool is properly set up as it is right here, yeah. then the question is, what is the direction of the moon at 6 p.m. and you're seeing it at first quarter? So if you want to respond, you can unmute or type it in the chat. Okay, we've got answers coming up in the chat. We have two responses that say it's in the south. Anybody disagree with that? We all agree on south. So if it's 6 p.m., you point the green arrow at 6 p.m. And then, uh, then you also locate first quarter, which also happens to be lined up with the arrow. So uh, then you read the direction letters, E, S, and W, and it's closest to the S. So it's in the south. The correct answer is south. OK, so that's number one. And when I give this quiz to my students, they're always allowed to use the tool. You know, you can have the diagram and have the tool in front of you. I tell them that, you know, I could make you memorize this and try to do it in your head. And then two weeks after the quiz, you promptly forget it. So, you know, my attitude is if you do it enough that the tool becomes a hindrance to you, you memorize it so you're faster. And then if you're not doing it for a living and you don't do it over and over again, hundreds of times, then you have the tool, right? So you use the reference until you don't need it anymore. Anyway, there's an example. Let's do another one. Example number two. This time I didn't put the tool on the picture. That's for you to do. And here's the, uh, the uh, situation. A waxing gibbous moon is seen rising in the east. What time is it? So again, a middle waxing gibbous moon right in the middle of the range. And if you see it rising in the east, uh, tell me what time is it? And you have uh, some choices there, 3 p.m., 9 p.m., midnight, and noon. So if you think you got it figured out, just type it in the chat, share it with us. You can also unmute yourself if you like. Okay, we got some people volunteering 3 p.m. Let's check that out. Pick up your tool, set it in the middle. We're going to rotate it so that the waxing gibbous moon is here. And I want to put the east next to it. So I spin it around and make east point at the waxing gibbous moon. And then I use the green arrow to tell what time it is. And it's pointing at 3 p.m. So 3 p.m. it is. That's how it works. So you can roughly tell what time it is at night by knowing the moon and the direction you're facing. Roughly. Um, OK, that's a good example. Now I'm going to tell an embarrassing story. And then I'm going to do another example. So here's my embarrassing story. When I was in college, uh, my professors told me, like I tell all my students, do not stay up all night studying for final exams because it makes you stupid. And you think you're cramming and you think you need to study. But if you're so tired, you can't think straight. It won't do you any good. So get some rest before your final exams. It's not worth it to stay up all night. My professors told me that. And like any other young student, I, I ignored it and stayed up all night to stand, study for an exam. So I, um, I stayed up, I think, 36 hours straight uh, studying for finals and staggered into the final exam and took it. Obviously, I passed because, you know, I'm here. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't remember how I did. I don't even remember what test it was, but I do remember what happened after the test. I was exhausted, totally, totally exhausted. So I went home and I, uh, it was about 6 p.m. after I finished everything on campus, I went back to my apartment. I fell into bed and said, oh, I don't have to be anywhere tomorrow. I'm just going to sleep in until I wake up. So I collapsed on the bed, fell asleep, and I 
uh, the sunlight in the morning woke me up and I you know, took some bleary eyes and cracked my eyes out and looked at the uh, clock and saw that it was 6 a.m. and slept 12 hours straight. And uh, so I got up 6 o'clock a.m. Oh, let's set the clock for 6 a.m. here. Here it is, 6 a.m. So then uh, I threw my bathrobe on. Like any good astronomer, the first thing you do is you go look out the window, see what the sky is doing, right? My dad used to get so mad at me for stepping out the door, looking up before I looked down and trip over my feet. So you got to keep your eyes on the ground, boy. And, you know, I didn't. So here I am. Anyway, 6 a.m., stagger out on the porch, look around the sky, see what's happening. Is it cloudy? It's going to be clear today. What's going to be like? And at 6 a.m., I looked over to the east, and sure enough, I saw the sun rising in the east. Kind of a foggy morning it was, and there was the sun rising in the east, looking kind of reddish some haze in the sky, a little bit of thin clouds covering it up. That was all good. And then I looked to the west, and then I saw the sun setting in the west at the same time. <laughs> as you all may know, that ain't right. <laughs> uh, so I immediately thought, oh, of course, it's the moon. The moon's got to be the moon. I hadn't been paying attention to the phase of the moon, but it's got to be the moon. But I looked carefully, and they, both of them were totally blank. It was a little bit hazy, but I couldn't see any surface features. And then I looked at the shadows, well, one of them's got to be brighter. That's got to be the sun. But the haze had obscured some of the bright light. There really wasn't any clear shadows on the ground. And so I start to have a biblical moment. And I'm like, there's two suns. There's two suns. This can't be right, man. <laughs> this can't be right. Something is wrong, man. And I got kind of shaky in the knees. And I got a little wobbly. Had to hang on to the porch, you know. And then I, I, you know, I'm trying to reconcile what my brain was telling me and what my eyes were telling me. It just didn't seem it could be possible. But then the, the moon started to go down below the clouds that were obscuring its surface features. And the sun rose just a little bit higher and started getting a little bit brighter. And I realized, oh my gosh, I'm looking at the full moon. And I can see it now. And I panicked and had a heart, racing heart for nothing. And it's just all I have left of that experience is an embarrassing story to tell when I'm teaching about moon phases. Because when Ever I teach about moon phases, I can always tell you, I distinctly remember that when the moon is full, it is exactly in the opposite direction of the sun, and it looks like it's the same size. So if you can't see the surface features, you could freak yourself out. So I'm just doing this as a public safety announcement to prevent anybody having premature heart attacks. If you think there's two suns, one of them is probably the moon. As you can see here, the sun would be on the eastern side, and the moon is on the western side, and they would be in opposite directions at least for a few minutes. So always remember when the moon is full, the earth is in the middle. You know, when you're studying eclipses, if the earth is in the middle, you, you're gonna have a solar eclipse. If the moon is in the middle, you're gonna have a lunar eclipse. And if the sun is in the middle between the earth and moon, you're gonna have an apocalypse, just to keep it. <laughs> All, right. All right, so that's example number two. Here's example number three. Let's see if you can do this one. We're about done with this one. We're gonna move on to other things. It's fun, but it's easy and we got other business. So here's our last one. If you know the time and direction, it's 6 a.m., you see the moon in the west, what's its phase? So 6 a.m., the moon's in the west, what's its phase? Let's see if you can remember that from my little story. Okay, let's see if you say sand is full, let's see. If it's 6 a.m., the arrow goes this way, and the sun, the moon is in the west. Oh, that's my little embarrassing story. So that must mean uh, it's a full moon. So that's what happened to me. That was the configuration during my story. So yeah, the moon is full at 6 a.m. if you see it in the west. All right, so now you got the moon, uh, moon calculator tool. It's pretty easy to use, a handy little thing. And uh, you can use it to, you know, it only goes by three hour jumps. I suppose if you were a little bit obsessive about it, you could be more precise. But generally, this is just a rule of thumb kind of thing. And, you know, myself, uh, you know, I try to do this in my head because, you know, old experienced guy is supposed to know what I'm doing. So I'm always sticking my arms up and making angles. It's just about 90 degrees from here to there. So the moon's over the sun's like this must be 3 p.m. kind of thing. But uh, the, the moon phase calculator makes it pretty clear how the, the moon's phase relates to its angle with the sun. All right. So I think we're done with that. Anybody have any questions about the moon phase calculator? That's about my limit of my inventiveness. That's the one I created. All the others are much more complicated and out of my pay grade, but I can at least uh, use other people's work and show it to you. So that's what's, that's what's coming next. So next we're gonna do the planisphere. I Googled 
world's largest planisphere. I ran across this picture here. So I know you've all seen planispheres, the star wheel inside of a frame. We're gonna talk about it for a little bit. Um, originally the planisphere just meant flat sphere and they, will, they also included earth maps that were drawn as a flat sphere, a projection. And you project a, two, a spherical map onto a two dimensional surface. I'm gonna show you a couple of little demos of this idea before we move on to the actual construction of our toy. But um, the biggest one I ever saw was actually 10 feet across, maybe, maybe 12. And it was installed in the ceiling of a little room. Um, a, and you could just reach up and touch it. And then you could push it with your hands and roll it around. So it was the roof of a little room in a, in a kid's science museum. And they had a little ladder so the kids could get to it. And then the, the adults could just reach it with their hands and spin it around. So it was a giant planisphere about 10 or 12 feet in diameter. And that's the biggest one I've ever seen. Um, the second biggest one I've ever seen is in this picture, and I've only seen it in this picture. I've, you know, uh, so they usually are something about the size of a, of a sheet of paper, but uh, they do come in various sizes and you can buy them and stuff. But before we get into, you know, how to make ours and how you can buy one, I want to show you the idea with a little three dimensional demo. And I'm going to switch, stop sharing the PowerPoint. I'm going to switch my camera to my. Uh, desktop camera. I have a little desktop webcam with an arm on it. So I'm going to switch to that camera. And that is this view here. And there it is. And then I'm going to pin myself to the front screen. So that's a nice big picture of a camera. So maybe you can see a, my hand waving at you in the camera here like this. You see that? You guys seeing that okay? All right. So let me show you the three-dimensional planisphere I have, which I I got at a fire sale at the ASP when they were uh, moving. They moved to offices. And when they moved, I went over and bought some stuff at a fire sale. And they had a whole bunch of stuff they were getting rid of to make space in a new shop. So I bought this thing. It's a, a globe. It's a sphere with a planisphere printed on the inside. And the bowl is two pieces. So there's the star map. On a three-dimensional bowl, you can put it over your head, pretend it's, you know, Doctor Stupid's personal planetarium, and then you can put this frame in it, and you can spin it around, see the horizon. There's little little buildings down here, and on the edge, the usual dates and time scales. There's a time scale on the inside here, and there's a date scale on the outside. And I'm pretty sure most of you know that when you use such a device, you match up the date to the time. That shows you what's in the window. So you know, you kind of, I kind of expect most of you already know what a planisphere looks like. And we're going to talk about how to use it and how to make one and everything, but uh, you've probably seen one. But the thing I wanted to show you is this neat trick. Is you take this thing like this, and then if you imagine just taking it sitting on a desk like this, and then you just like, if you were to squash it flat, if it was made of rubber, you squash it flat and you'd have a planisphere. This isn't really a planisphere because it's not flat. It's, a, it's sort of like a, a planetarium painted on a globe. And then you squash it down flat. I want to note that if you look at it from the outside, like this, I don't know if you can read it. You probably can't. But all the words are written backwards. The constellation star pictures are backwards. That becomes an important point later in the presentation. But anyway, I want you to imagine that this thing was made of uh, rubber. And then you just squash it flat. And imagine what that would look like. And what that would look like is this. And this is an old thing that I have had for years. You probably uh, may or may not have seen one. It's called a night star. They don't think they make them anymore. But when it was new and handy to use, it had oil in between the two layers of this star map. And you could roll it around the edge. And then you could uh, uh, line it up for any latitude on Earth and look up inside the bowl like a planisphere to see what's in the sky. But the reason I wanted to show it to you is, uh, is to imagine that we have this three-dimensional bowl like this. And then we just do it like that. You squash it flat. Right. If you squash it flat, you have a planisphere. So that's what we call a projection. Uh, you remove the third dimension by just sort of shining light through it to make it uh, come out flat. All right, so I think I'm done with that little demonstration. So I'm gonna stop this view here and go back to the camera and then start up the presentation again. So I'm gonna unpin myself from the first screen. Let's see. Right, done that. And share the PowerPoint again. Yeah, I've done this a few times. Here we go. So back to this thing, right? So what a planisphere is then is a three-dimensional bowl shape, you know, the, the vault of heaven, the ancients used to call it, 
compressed flat onto a two-dimensional surface. The center, you know, the rotating disk, is the North Star. And then this hole here represents what you can see in the sky. The edge of it is the horizon. So you take that rubber mat I showed you and stretch it over your head like an umbrella. And it shows the sky in every direction. That means the center of the hole right here is the zenith. And yes, the hole's shape does change shape depending on your latitude. Uh, and the one we're making is designed for about 40 degrees north latitude. And you can you know, find uh, planetarium websites that'll uh, planisphere websites that'll show you how to change the shape of the hole for different latitudes but 40 degrees is pretty close to where we live so that's not too bad um so i did the usual wikipedia search on uh planispheres here's an example of a, a map that was uh a year around the year 1000 a.d that was laid out in planisphere style and then over here is a piece um of a, a guy uh, named jacob march who was the son-in-law of johannes kepler uh, it was the first person to make a star map that was called a planisphere back in 1624. So um, he uh, was also an assistant that helped do some of the same calculations for Kepler that Kepler was also doing for Tycho Brahe. So he was helping with some of those calculations and was an astronomer of his own in his own right. But uh, the thing that you might be most notable for is the first person to make an official star map planetarium. Here's a piece of it um, made in 1613. Um, this is a picture here of the largest planisphere I could find on the web that you could buy, and it's pretty expensive, it's about 250 euros, and you order it from Europe. So if you want to make a bigger one, you can do what I did, and you can print it out on the giant poster printer, so I'll show that to you in the camera view here. Uh, you can also buy the one size of a sheet of paper from Edmund Scientific, that's a famous one. That one has been around for years and years and years, but they kind of overpriced it now for 15 bucks is something you can make for a less than a dollar in your own printer. So I don't know, you know, they're kind of trading off that long standing name for that. I don't, I don't think that's $15 with a paper there, but um, you can buy some pretty nice ones that are uh, intermediate size. So let me show you this uh, one I made. That's the same design you're gonna make, just bigger. Uh, let's see here. Uh, show it to you over in the corner of the room here. There it is. It's kind of an awkward view, but there it is over there. I'll go get it. So this one is about two and a half feet wide and I printed it on a giant poster printer. It's the same exact design you're making, but it's nice and big. Good for star parties in classrooms. So I can use that as an example of one. Um, and we're going to learn to make that next. So that's my great big plan planisphere. And I use that for at the planetarium at our school and in class sometimes uh, to explain to students how to do it. I made one and made the mistake of taking it to Los Medanos College. And the, uh, the astronomy teachers there liked it so much they stole it. So, you know, <laughs> so I had to make another one. So you got a big giant poster printer, you can make a great big one. All right, let's reactivate this PowerPoint again. There we go. All right, so um, this is a nice one, but it is pretty pricey. You can also buy, I have several, I have a little collection of planospheres. Um, this is my smallest one. Here it is. Let's see if I can show that to you. It's a wristwatch made into a planisphere. So you turn the dial on the front to set the date to the time and the little window in between shows you what constellations are up. So uh, that's my smallest planisphere. But my eyes aren't what they used to be. So I have a little more trouble reading it than when I, I, when I was younger. But uh, it does, it's a functioning planisphere, the smallest one I have. Okay, I think I already showed you that. So you'll, you'll forgive me for skipping that. And now we're gonna start uh, talking about how to build this planisphere designed by Dr. Alan Gould. I took a class with him one time and I've worked with him on a couple of education projects. So uh, this is his design, it's been around for many years. Um, and uh, we're gonna use that. It's designed for 40 degrees north. So here's your first step. You uh, cut out the wheel that has stars on it. There are two of them provided. Uh, one of them is for, um, has a map on it, has a grid, so you can read right ascension declination numbers on it. 
But uh, you know, for beginners, I prefer to use the one without the grid because it's simpler to look at. He also produced one for the Southern Hemisphere that you can find on the website in the references. Um, but uh, this is the one for us. The North Star is in the center. There's the Polaris attached to the Little Dipper. There's the Big Dipper pointing to it. And our old friend Orion is down here and over here is Hercules and so on. It's got a ring of dates around the outside edge. You just cut it out and glue it onto card stock. I used a manila file folder for mine that I made today. And then you, uh, uh, then you cut out the, the frame. Here's the frame. It's a little bit unclear after all these years, you'd think that the, it would be more obvious, but exactly what you cut out is you cut out the hole in the center and you cut out the top of the frame as I've shown here. But a lot of my students try to cut these dotted lines too, and you're not supposed to cut the dotted lines. You leave those intact because you fold it up. So you glue this in the cardstock as well and cut out the hole in the middle and cut off the top of the lid. But the, the, the dotted lines are fold lines and you don't cut those. So um, I don't know how many of you are actually attempting to do this as I talk about it. And then if you've done it already or if you're gonna do it in the future, but I'm gonna kind of go at a kind of comfortable pace here. This one's pretty easy to construct. So once you cut out the frame, you do use the fold lines as follows to make a pocket. And you can secure it state with the tape would be better than staples because um, you don't want to staple and have the wheel run into the staple. But if you just fold that over and tape it down, you got a pretty good frame right there. And then you stick the wheel inside the pocket like I showed you with the giant one and you're good to go. Um, in case you've never used one, um, I'm pretty sure all of you've seen them, but just in case, you operate it by putting the date next to the time and do keep in mind that it doesn't know anything about daylight saving time. So you'd have to compensate for that. So 9 p.m. February 23rd or 4th, it would be aligned like this. So you put the date next to the time and then what's in the wheel is in the sky. Mm -hmm. um, the edge of the wheel is the horizon. Notice it's marked north, south, east, and west. And then the center of the wheel is the zenith, which would be straight over your head. Now, the advantage of a planisphere over, you know, we have all these wonderful apps and my students use them too. Uh, my students are required to make observations of the sky at night and draw pictures or take photos with their cameras and then label what they've seen so they, they can identify it, they get to count it. And by the end of the semester, they have to have identified 50 things in the sky. This also includes data from lab experiments in class. So it's not terribly difficult to get to 50. They're intimidated by that because they think they have to know it before they, they can draw the picture. But the simplest thing is just draw a picture of it. And then a lot of them really, really want to use their phones for everything in their lives. The problem with the phone is that the phone has a tiny window. If you shrink the picture down enough to see the whole sky, it's too small to read. If you make it big enough to read it, then you can only see a little bit of the sky. It's like looking at the sky with the blinders. And you can only see a little window what's in front of you. you so I can tell when they're using their phone to draw the sky, instead of actually drawing the sky, they draw the phone because they'll draw half of Orion. They'll leave half of it off because it wasn't on the phone screen. Um, they'll draw Orion, they won't draw Sirius, right? And of course, the other problem with that pro project is that they'll point their phone at the floor while they lay it on their desk and they'll point at some constellation in the Southern hemisphere and draw that. So they'll draw things that are impossible because they're not actually going out to look at the real sky and they'll draw their phone because uh, you know their whole life is centered on their phone. The advantage the planisphere has is that you can see the whole sky at once, big enough to identify it. So you can you know, point to Orion and say, what's to the left of it? What's above it? What's high in the sky above it? What's to the right? And you can see the major bright stars. The number of stars on the wheel is limited and it's about what you'd see in a suburban sky. So you don't get too many stars. A lot of times my students will draw uh, pictures of what they see and they'll claim to see NGC 1756 and they see the heart flame nebula and you can't see those things. It's just on the phone because that's where it is. So they'll draw a picture of Saturn, put a little ring around it. Like they could see the rings with their own two eyes just because the software draws a little picture of Saturn where Saturn is. So, you know, I keep telling them that you can try to cheat if you want but you're probably not very good at it. So it's much easier to just go outside and draw some dots uh, and see the real world if you possibly can. Anyway, so the, there is still a, a, still a role for the planisphere to play because the, it, it, it shows the relationship of large scale things in the sky. Like, you know, the winter football is much easier seen on a planisphere than it is on a tiny computer screen or a tiny uh, phone screen. So I'm, you know, I emphasize to them, I, you don't have to know it when you see it, you just have to figure out what it is later. So uh, 
And of course, the phones are good enough now that they can start to photograph constellations with a raw phone. They don't need a telescope for it. So that's becoming more popular in my classes as students will take a picture of a constellation, but they still have to go back and identify what it was. Um, so screen grabs of simulator apps do not count. Observations are real, not simulated. So anyway, that's how you use it. Um, I found this one, which I like to share with you on a let's change the sharing focus to this web page. So I don't know, like, you know, I just think it's kind of cool, but it is actually a web based uh, planisphere. So it operates like a real planisphere, except it's all digital. So you can spin it around. The only thing you can't do is that when you're using a planisphere, um, it's best, it's like the, if I were to rotate it to approximately now, it would look something like this. So in the southern sky, maybe slightly off to the west of south, there's Orion tonight. That's what it looks like right about now. So the period of February, you know, late February, it's about nine o'clock p.m. Okay, that makes some sense. So, um, but uh, when you're using the planisphere, you hold it like this when it's uh, a view is facing south. However, if you're facing north, all these constellations are upside down and behind you. So in practice, what you would do is turn the planisphere upside down and hold it with north on the bottom. So in operation, you put the direction you're facing on the bottom while not spinning the, frame, the wheel within the frame. And then whatever's near the bottom of the window is exactly the arrangement you'd see in the sky. The stuff here is straight over your head. The stuff here is behind you. And you can't see that until you turn around. So as you turn around in a circle with the planisphere, uh, you would rotate it to keep the direction you're facing on the bottom. And that would be the typical way you'd use such a thing. Okay, so um, that's pretty much it for planispheres. Uh, they're pretty easy to use, they're fun. Uh, I have a small collection that I um, haul them out during a star party and show people stuff. Uh, I have one uh, um, that has glow in the dark stars, so that's pretty fun. Um, so uh, at this point, and, the, and there's another one I have here that's got uh, David H. Levy's Guide to the Stars, that's this one. And a lot of them have information on the back that's more time-based, like the, the positions of the planets for the next few years. This one has tables of when the meteor showers are. And then, uh, so this one is, uh, it's laminated so that if you get it wet, it can just wipe it off. And so that's kind of nice because you do often use them outside in the wet and the damp. And the paper ones will tend to get, you know, wrinkly. So yeah, I got a little collection of plant spheres for different purposes. But uh, that's the end of part two of my three-part presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Let's see, I think I answered Marnie's question kind of already about, you can see the relationship of large constellations better than an app. Um, and also it tends to be more limited to what you can actually see as an app will, over, will uh, show you everything that's in the sky and uh, probably things that you'll, you, sometimes my students make an honest mistake if they think they're looking at a thing and they just misidentify it. That's one thing. But um, when they're not actually looking at the sky, that's what's concerning to me. We haven't been able to do live star parties. Um, I did get a new web-based telescope and for my next star party, I'm gonna be doing like a live telescopic view. It's a, um, it's a unistellar telescope. I don't know if you've seen the ads for those, but you can take pictures with it live. And it's great for star parties because you can you can take deep sky pictures. The camera's built into the telescope. It's self-aligning. It's the, it's the easiest telescope I've ever touched with my hands. I, I, it's like I'm up and running in minutes uh, as opposed to the long time it takes me to hook up my camera and my computer to the big telescope and align it and polar align it and all that stuff. I use the interstellar telescope and I'm up and running in 10 minutes and I can share it over uh, a Zoom meeting and show the live picture from the telescope and take a picture of the ring nebula and then take a picture of the Orion nebula and have it for them in two minutes. So um, uh, I've been using that lately, but eventually I do hope to go back to live uh, star parties with my classes. I promised my classes that I'm gonna try and do one live meeting with them before they leave me at the end of the school year. We're gonna go out in the backyard of the school and do some you know, actual live observing before they leave my class. Anyway, uh, that's the end of the planet sphere section. And you have the design from Alan Gould, and you can make a nice little plan for you that works really well. If anybody has any questions, now's your chance. I don't... I'm not sure that's a question. I just hear a microphone noise. right here. And um, okay. right ahead. You can... Hey, Jeff. Jason here. Hi. What that uh, automatic 
uh, webcam telescope you just talked about, what is the starting price of one of those? Ridiculously expensive. <laughs> like the, I was actually you have to, asking. They're, yeah, they're from they're from a company in France, and I got a grant to pay for mine. It's about four thousand dollars, and it's only about a four inch telescope. But nevertheless, it's it's uh, it auto auto aligns itself. You don't even have to know any guide stars. It takes a picture of the sky and matches it against an internal map and figures out what it's pointing to, and then uh, so it it auto aligns by itself. You just have to turn it on, wait a few minutes, and then it knows where it is. And then you pick a target and slews to it and only roughly guesses where the target is. And then it takes another picture and figures out where it's wound up and then it zeroes in on it. And then a couple of minutes later, your target's in the center. So um, uh, it does an altitude azimuth mount. It doesn't use uh, you know, uh, equatorial settings. And uh, you can't, it doesn't even have an eyepiece in the traditional sense. It has a tiny camera, a video camera with a, a magnifying glass on it on the telescope itself. And you usually operate it through your phone or your tablet. So you're looking at the camera's digital picture through the Wi-Fi connection. I can actually sit in my house and operate it by remote outside wirelessly. But it is expensive. The pictures, uh, I mean, you guys who are astrophotographers can take higher quality pictures than this thing can produce. Uh, it's not meant to replace the high quality rigs that you're spending your time and money and, and love for. But uh, on the other hand, it's really great for public viewing because it's super quick and really easy. Yeah. Do you have yes. there to show us? I'm sorry, it's downstairs. It's at my house, but it's downstairs. All right. Um, you know, but um, in the really? Uh, does anybody else I'll have one of those yet? I got a grant from a Corteva gave me money to buy that. What's the brand? Steve? It's called a Unistellar. I'll type it in. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, I've been doing this a long time, and I'm not as experienced or talented as some of you guys with astrophotography, but I have to tell you, it is the easiest telescope I have ever touched with my hands. It really is. So uh, for the purposes that I put it, it is perfect. And, you know, for making high quality magazine quality publications of, you know, star pictures that you want to put on a poster. Yeah, not so much. But, you know, if you've not ever done any serious astrophotography and you'd like to you know, like take a picture of virtually anything, it's no good for planets. It's not it's a terrible planet telescope. It's great for deep sky stuff. But it doesn't do much. Uh, it does good with the moon, but you know the planets. They it just doesn't magnify enough. The resolution is not sharp enough to show, like uh, the Cassini division in the rings of Saturn doesn't really show up very well. But you know things that are extended nebulas are they're just terrific. And usually after just a few minutes, you can get an image. Anyway, um, now we're going to move on to the third part, and this part is about. Uh, let me change the sharing focus here. And that would be, you know, after I'm done here, maybe I run downstairs and get it if you really want to see it. But it's it's a sweet looking little telescope. It's really easy to set up, but um, it's it's in my uh, I keep it next to my back door so I can take it outside pretty quick. Let's see, where's my sharing screen? There it is. All right. So our third thing is about the astrolabe. An astrolabe is a sort of a high powered planisphere on steroids, and they're a medieval uh, star calculator device that's used to uh, not only tell what stars are up, but also can tell where the position of the sun and the moon is. Uh, well, the sun, I don't think it does the moon. Um, it can tell what time of day it is. You can use it as a time calculator to track things. And it uh, has a number of other more subtle functions. It has a lot of parts. And the front of it is a stick called the rule. Um, that's used to take, uh, 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 it's got a, a declination scale on it, so you can tell the declination on the equatorial scale. Then traditional ones, the medieval ones, have a thing called a reet, and it looks like this elaborate uh, scroll work that you see. Um, and the way that they would normally work is that the scroll work has little points on it here and there, and those points represent specific large stars, like guide stars, like Aldebaran or Vega Sirius. They'll point to those stars because in those days they couldn't make a transparent piece of uh, glass 
that had writing etched in it. They didn't have plastic, so they just used an open framework that pointed to a handful of what we would call major guide stars. Um, the one we're going to make has got a transparency in place of the reed, so you can print more stars on it and it doesn't obstruct your view. Then there's a series of scales that are interchangeable called the mother. Um, they actually call this little indentation where you store the extra scales called the womb. At least that's what Jeffrey Chaucer called it when he wrote a treatise on astrolabes. So uh, each one is latitude specific, so you swap it out based on where you're located. Um, we're only going to have one, uh, uh, one mother, and it's one base for 40 degrees north. And the back of it, you can see a little bit of it here sticking out, is another stick that looks like the rule, but it's called an Adelaide, and that's used for uh, doing sight lines. Uh, so we're going to put this together made of cardboard and paper. Here's how you would assemble it if you haven't made one already you want to make one later. So um, the parts that are provided I got from a web page, and I credited that on the, on the references. So um, you, this is the front of the mother, and you cut it out and glue it on cardstock. I did it on a, on a manila file folder here, so I just cut it out and glued it on the glue stick. And then uh, number two, you do the same for the back side. It's got a lot of complicated looking scales. I am going to spend a few minutes telling you what some of the scales do. It's a rather sophisticated instrument, to be honest with you, even this paper one. And uh, to use it as an expert will take a lot of time, but there are a few simple things you can do with it that are not too complicated. So you glue this on the back of the same card and make these little finger tabs line up so they automatically align correctly front to back. Uh, traditionally, there's a hole in this little finger tab and you hang it from a string when you're using it. Uh, so it's used as a, a way of telling which way is straight up and down and where's the zenith. It should be lined up with this line. So uh, traditionally, you punch a hole here and tie a string to it. I, you know, I just hold it with my fingers and let it hang down below it. The next piece is the, uh, the, uh, the reet. I mean, the, uh, yeah, the reed. So um, this is just printed on a sheet of transparency paper and cut out. It has a little hole in the middle, like all the others. You're going to punch a hole through all those little circles and put a, a grommet to, to let them rotate around each other. And finally, you get two of these ruler devices, the Adelaide and the, uh, um, the rule. So the Adelaide has the little flaps on it. Those are not mistakes. Don't cut them off. You need them. So these little flaps are part of it. And then the, the rule is here. Notice that the zero is in the middle of the scale. That represents the celestial equator. And you have north and south declination numbers. So it's a declination scale. Um, and notice that they're not evenly spaced because like the planisphere, the picture has been compressed and made flat. Oh, I forgot to mention on the Adelaide. Um, if you look at it carefully, like if you see Orion or something you recognize, you'll notice that the constellations are backwards. So if you look here, there's Orion upside down. And then the Sir Sirius is on the right side of its feet. Whereas on our maps is on the left, it's printed backwards on purpose. That's not a mistake. And the author of the web page that designed this said he didn't know why they did that. And I think I do know because a lot of medieval star maps were printed on spheres. And when you print them on spheres, you have to print them backwards because you're on the outside of the sphere instead of on the inside looking out. Looking out. And I think they were mimicking that the star maps they're familiar with are actually printed backwards on spheres so that they would you know, imagine that you had a celestial sphere that's transparent. It's designed for you to be on the inside of it looking out, but you can't get inside the, the sphere when you have a like a globe in front of you. So you're looking at it from the outside and everything on my giant celestial sphere I have in my classroom is printed backwards. And I think that the designers of the astrolabe were mimicking those maps that were common in the medieval era. Anyway, so you get all these pieces, you cut these things out. And finally, how do you assemble it? It goes in this order. The rule goes on top, the reet, the transparent, she goes second. The mother goes third with the side that has alphabetic letters on the outside edge on top. And then the Adelaide, you can't see it in this picture, but it's on the bottom. And then you use the grommet in the middle, punch it through all the holes, loosen it up so it'll spin, and then you've assembled your astrolabe. So it's not too hard to build, um, but uh, it does do a lot of stuff. So. I'm just going to walk you through in the time I have left a few of the simple things you can do with an astrolabe. It's really like a, a really uh, extra sophisticated planisphere. It does more than a planisphere. So here's a few things you can do with the uh, astrolabe. First of all, you can measure the altitude of a star to find out what its altitude above the ground. And if you may remember, altitude is the angle from the horizon measured up towards the zenith. So if you use the backside, this is the backside of it. 
And I've kind of obscured most of the lines, so you'll pay attention to the outer ring here. That is an altitude scale on the backside of the, of the uh, um, astrolabe. So if you hold it with your fingers right here and then let it hang straight down, 90 is at the top, like the zenith at 90 degrees altitude angle. Zero is along the horizon, so this line represents the horizon. And then here's your um, Adelaide that can rotate. If you fold the flaps up, they make a sight line like a gun sight. And then you can tilt this, put your face down here, and then aim it at some star uh, while it's hanging with the horizon line at your eyeballs. You, you rotate that so that, that that little stick and their little flaps are lined up on some star. And then the numerical scale on the side will measure the angle of it up from the horizon. So it is actually a measuring tool as well as a map. The planisphere does not measure the stuff. This is this would be like a quadrant. That's basically a protractor with a with an indicator line on it. So used in this fashion, you can measure the altitude. Typically, was used to measure the altitude of the sun, possibly the moon, and uh, certain guide stars. You'd find the altitude of say Sirius and see how many degrees it is above the horizon. So that's one function. It uses the outer ring on the back side of the of the uh, of the mother. Now, uh, all of these different circles have different purposes. Some of them are just informational. Some of them are calculational. So for example, these are all about calendars on this side of the, on the device. And the, this is the back of it. So for example, uh, the ancient equal angled uh, zodiac constellations, 30 degrees wide each, they're marked. And there's a date scale. So you can tell what day of the month it is. There are several calendars on it. Uh, there's a calendar based on Geoffrey Chaucer's treatise on astrolabes written in 1394. Those dates are on this ring, and that would be traditional on a medieval uh, astrolabe. But the person who designed this also added in a calendar based on the, the last major calendar adjustment is apparently 1974, and uh, that's the one we've been using since. And there's been no significant change since then. So this calendar is what we use here. So this inner ring of dates is the uh, position of the sun on the particular date. And then um, this is a, in some Christian uh, services, they put the saints in a circle and identify dates of the year with sa certain saints. There's different, it's usually they said done locally based on your local parish, but this is sort of a generic one that they made up for it. So all of this uh, entire scale is about dates. And uh, uh, you could use it to figure out the position of the sun uh, against the date, basically, when you're trying to use this device as a sun tracker. Um, let's see what else we got. In planisphere mode, back to the front of the thing, uh, there is not a date and a time wheel to align like there is in a planisphere. If you wanted to use it, you're using it to observe the stars. So you might take a, an, an altitude reading of Sirius, for example, and see that Sirius is located um, at approximately, uh, you know, say, 30 degrees altitude. And then what you do is you rotate this so that uh, Sirius, this uh, this grid in the background is, a, is an equatorial grid printed on the mother, and then Sirius is printed on the transparency. So when you spin it, it doesn't stay on this line. This is a, um, I'm sorry, it's an altitude azimuth grid. So you, this line that I put Sirius on here lines up over here at 30 degrees altitude. Everything on this line is at 30 degrees altitude. So if you can line up Sirius on that line, then that means the position of the map of stars is aligned with Sirius's actual position in the sky. And that would put all the other stars in their correct approximate altitudes and azimuths for that moment in time. So you'd use one star as a mar as a guide star, as a marker, and line it up with its known altitude. It only, it only fits on that line twice, once when it's rising and once when it's setting. And so you know roughly what direction you're facing. You have to know that to use this device. So, so Sirius is at 30 degrees altitude somewhere in the eastern direction. Then you'd put it on this side, and then everything else would come lined up. And you can use it to, to tell where everything else is in the sky. If you do it right, you don't see two circles here. Mine's slightly off center because it's not built perfectly. Uh, these two lines, one's on the, on the reet and one's on the mother, and they should line up if you built it up to perfectly align it. Up here, you see a series of dates, uh, 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 constellations, and markers. So once you figure out what constellation the sun is in, you can use that to tell where the sun is in the sky. Um, to telling time with the uh, astrolabe is a bit complicated. Um, so uh, uh, in medieval times, apparently they used a system called unequal hours, and it works like this. They declared that there's 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night every day, no matter what. So instead of having a clock that ran at a constant rate, they would just say in the wintertime, hours are shorter in the daytime and hours are longer at night. 
they would change the length of an hour. So it's always six hours of daylight and six hours of nighttime. The system's called unequal hours. And the, these Roman numerals here show the unequal hour times for uh, dividing up six hours of daylight and six hours of nighttime. Um, whereas the numbered letters on the outside edge are for equal hours in our modern clocks. And they're all exactly 15 degrees apart. And uh, not coincidentally, M is lined up with midnight. And so that would be noon, one, two, three, and so on. So if you're trying to uh, figure out what time the sun is in a particular place, you could use the equal hour thing to match up with uh, what the sun looks like it's doing, like in dividing up the sky in half and thirds. You can say, okay, well, the sun's in its third hour uh, of, uh, based on its angle. You could estimate the sun's position based on the equal hour system uh, because the sun is, uh, there's always gonna be six divisions between noon and 6 p.m. And they're not always the same size, but there's always six divisions. And then you could convert it to clock time uh, uh, using equal hours, using the scale on the outside. And so it's a time calculator. Another interesting thing that you can do, I mean, it does a lot of stuff. I, I suspect there's stuff I don't even really understand. But the, the one thing you can use for is to measure the altitude heights of vertical structures like buildings. So if you use the Adelaide on the back and line it up on a top of a building or a mountain or something, the uh, angles here are marked out in twelfths. So here I've lined up a triangle with the four, which means that this uh, base here is four times higher, longer than the height. And that is essentially finding the tangent of the angle. So you could use it if you knew how far away the building was and you know that it's lined up on the four, you could figure out how tall the building is or the mountain or the structure or whatever it is you're measuring. So it's an altitude measuring angle that was used for um, survey, actually. So and that's built into the back of the mother in the center part here. This little circle is called the uh, shadow scale because it's used to measure shadows of buildings. And uh, that's another thing you can do, do with it. So it does a lot more. And the guy, the website that I referenced in the, in the references has a, a very thorough treatment uh, and also the history of how Jeffrey Chaucer the writer from the Middle Ages uh, wrote a treatise on astrolabes and explained how to use them. I don't have enough time to go into any more details, but it's just to give you a hint that this thing is a sophisticated, it looks too complicated to even look at at first, but if you start isolating it circle by circle, each one has a purpose and you can kind of start to figure it out. And the web page that I took this from is really excellent and it talks about, you know, example problems and how to use it. And it also lets you customize it. So you could, you could print out the uh, circles are different for different latitudes. So you could print out one that's customized for your location. Uh, it talks about, uh, even there's a little section about how would you build an astrolabe for the equator, which is pretty challenging. Uh, how would you do one for the Southern hemisphere? Um, the symbol for the astrolabe interestingly pops up in Stellarium. If uh, a lot of you use that software for simulating the sky, there's an astrolabe on it and it's the ephemeris calculations window is a button that's shaped like an astrolabe. If you click it up, it brings up an ephemeris for calculating positions of the sun and the planets. So um, I'm running out of time. So I just wanna end with my last little picture here. Uh, so I don't run over. And uh, this one more circle, I didn't put this in the official things, but because I, to be honest with you, I found it in a box just before I did the presentation. <laughs> so here's my last one. This is the perpetual calendar that I bought in a science museum as a kit. It has gears inside of it and you can turn the wheels. So I've lined it up here uh, with the year 2000, 22 for February. Down here's February again, but that's for leap years. So if I put 2022 and put February next to the year, then I get a perpetual calendar down here and it says Tuesday is on the 22nd. So it'll tell you what day of the week is the name of the day of the week between the years 2017 and 2044. And this is just another device that uses wheels to do a an astronomy calculation. Um, it is suspected that the Anca theorem device, I'm not to pronounce it, the one they found that was an ancient Greek calculator is probably some kind of a mechanical geared device that is used to do astronomical calculations like an astrolabe. And if you rotate it, uh, the gears inside were supposed to uh, show the positions of the planets and the moon. Um, they've done reconstructions and tried to build modern versions of it to make it operate. So uh, we didn't even know that the Greeks made gears and we found that old device. And uh, it's sort of like a really even more sophisticated astrolabe because it does the planets as well. And your typical astrolabe doesn't have planets on it. If you can find a, an astrolabe that's like, you know, 
actually functional made of metal they're pretty expensive and pretty rare and that of course the medieval ones are are now collectors items and normally in museums anyway that was my last slide and, and i'm available to answer any questions if i can uh, i hope if you put these together you have a little fun with them they're kind of fun uh good for groups especially if you have the ability to build one of those great big plant planospheres that's pretty handy but if there are any questions for you um thanks for inviting me again and i appreciate um the chance to do this and uh get to talk to somebody besides students who are you know glued to their phones so i appreciate that so, thank you guys thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think it's just so cool that you teach. Um, and we, I had, uh, I remember we had five days of astronomy in fifth grade and that was it. And, yeah, me too. And, and we learned um, never eat shredded wheat. That's how we could remember <laughs> where everything was or where the direction of where, where you were. I have a little story about that. Uh, when, when I was in the fifth grade, um, I had a new young teacher out of college named Mr. Cooper. And uh, in my fifth grade class, before he came to be my teacher, this was a real old school and all the desks were bolted to the floor with nuts and bolts. You couldn't move them. And the teacher that was there before him was very strict. So if you put your foot up on one toe and wiggled your foot or tapped your foot, she said, put your foot down. It was that kind of a school, you know. So he's a young teacher. He came in. The first thing he did was unbolt all the desks so you can make them in circles and stuff. And then uh, one day he put the worksheets up on a circle around the room so that we, you know, we didn't just have another handout to, to do. We got to get up and walk around the room, which we thought was the greatest thing ever. But I do remember when one day we did the planets and, you know, I was a little astronomy nerd, even in the fifth grade. So I was running around the room answering all the questions as fast as I can because I knew all the answers. You know, how far is Earth from the sun? But 93 million, I had all the distances to the planets memorized and all that good stuff. But the, the one that stumped me was, uh, does Saturn have seasons? And I always tell the story to my students because it's a, it's a question about like constructed knowledge. Um, so the book, didn't I didn't know, and sad, the book didn't have anything in the seasons page about Saturn and nothing on the Saturn page about seasons. So I'm like, Mr. Cooper, Mr. Cooper, the answer's not in the back of the book. What am I supposed to do? And then he said something that stuck with me ever since. The only thing I remember that man teaching me, he says, Jeffrey, not every answer is in a book. Sometimes you just got to figure it out. Figure out what you know. So he guided me to the answer that since Saturn is tilted and tilted causes seasons, Saturn does in fact have seasons. But that fact had to be figured out. It wasn't in the book. Difficult to Google. Um, so I try to come up with what I call anti-Google questions, stuff that's hard to Google because uh, it's rarely answered. And that's one of my anti-Google questions. Anyway, fifth grade story. That's what we did in astronomy in fifth grade. Anything else I can do for you? Uh, check chat. Um, yeah. uh, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Uh, I'll send an invitation next time I do a public star party with that little telescope so you can see how it operates. Um, my friend Scott Cardell teaches at Palomar University, Palomar College in Southern California. I went to school with him and he was a former director of the uh, education for Palomar Observatory and uh, worked for the International Dark Sky Association. So my friend Scott got one and I instantly became jealous and uh, saw his pictures coming out. So uh, I didn't buy one, but I went out and got a little grant. So that's a nice little scope. Yeah, you could. Um takes, I mean, you could send some of your images to Marty to put in our newsletter. Okay. Uh, like I say, they're no great shakes compared to some of the stuff you guys can do. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it was pretty easy. So, you know, some of it's better than anything I've ever done. And I know that's not saying a lot because I don't have the skills and the equipment some of you guys do. But still, uh, you know, you can recognize what you're looking at. And, um, and there, you can do a little bit of processing on them and make them a little bit better. So it's not completely automatic. Anyway. Okay, I think we Thanks again. I really appreciate the offer to, to come do this. I, I really enjoy it. Well, we're going to have to have you back next week. We seem to do this about the same time. Yeah, works for me. Right. Well, we'll look forward to it.
question. All right. Well, I think that's about it, guys. Everybody. All right. Well, guys, thank you much for coming by. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And Eric, I think you're still here. Thank you. Good night. Take care, everyone. All right. No, it actually changes with <laughs> <laughs> respect to each other. <laughs>